open your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. That is where we will be today. Acts chapter 16. We've got an incredible story for you today. And uh, hopefully you got your bulletin. And if you're the sort that likes to take notes, or maybe, maybe you don't like to take notes, but you know that if you're waiting for the next blank on the sermon sheet, you know that you'll pay attention a little bit better or something like that. I just hope these are helping you out. Uh, I shamelessly stole today's sermon title from a book written by Brother Andrew. I don't know if it's because he died recently that I'm thinking a lot about him, or perhaps it's because we're working on revitalizing this church that I'm thinking about a lot of the lessons that I learned reading about his escapades, smuggling Bibles into the Soviet Union, and then after the Soviet Union fell, and I didn't know this, in, in America his book was published under the title God's Smuggler. Very descriptive. That's what Americans want. We want to know what the book's about before we buy it. Uh, in other countries it was published under the uh, title The Narrow Road because being a Christian, in fact, if, as we read in the book of Acts, we're not going to read that part today, but we see that uh, in Antioch, when, when Antioch becomes one of the bases of Christianity, it was there that the followers of Jesus were first referred to as Christians, Christians, the uh, people who follow Christ. Before that, what was it? Well, the followers of Jesus simply called it the way. They were followers of the way. And, and um, of course, Jewish life had a very specifically prescribed way to go. You don't eat unclean animals. And, you, you know, if you're familiar at all with the Old Testament laws, you had to not work every seventh day. And that was, in fact, tied to creation. God made the world and all that is in it in six days and rested on the seventh. And to show everyone, everyone, human beings, emperors, principalities, powers, demonic forces, angelic beings, to show everyone that you follow the Creator God, the King of the universe, you work six days and you rest on the seventh, just like He did. And, and of course, you were supposed to go to synagogue ever since they had been carried off into the exile, uh, that you couldn't go to the temple and sacrifice. There was no temple for so many years, and so you would go and you would hear the readings of the Law of Moses and yearn for that time when you could go back to the temple and, and make those sacrifices to God. And lo and behold, the children of Israel were able to return to the land and rebuild the temple. It was nothing like Solomon's temple. But they were able to return to the land and rebuild the temple. And they kept that tradition of going to learn what God's word says on that Sabbath day. And if they couldn't make it from where they lived to Jerusalem, of course, people lived all over the Roman Empire. So sometimes you lived up in Galilee and it was a 70-mile trek down to, uh, down to the temple at Jerusalem. Or sometimes you lived in what we call Spain today and you were maybe only going to get there once in your lifetime. Uh, regardless, you could still sit in synagogue on the Sabbath and hear readings from the book of Moses. And so Jewish life had a very prescribed way. This is the way to please God. This is the way to follow God. And of course... Guys like Peter and Andrew, James and John, and later Paul, who we will be talking about today. God had set up all of that history, all of the law of Moses, all of the traditions of the elders to point to Jesus. And so now we have Jesus who paid for all that sin. And yet there is still a way to follow, a way to follow Jesus. As Jesus says, love your enemies. Oh, wow. That sounds like a way I don't want to go. Love and forgive and pray for your enemies. I thought we should just utterly defeat the enemies. But no, love and pray for your human enemies. And, and give, give without asking. Give, um, <clears throat> I don't want to step on that later. Give of your shirt or your tunic or whatever without expecting anything in return. Jesus asked for quite a way and he gave his life on the cross so that we could be purchased, we could be free from our sin nature. And sometimes we don't uh, describe following Jesus. We, we talk about 
getting saved or having God do something for us in a moment. And I want you to know it can happen in a moment. We've been baptizing people lately, and that's been so much fun. Apparently, that's the only time anybody shows up to church, amen? But uh, we ba <laughs> we're not baptizing anybody today, and we're down. But uh, anyways, you know, we've, we've opened up that in-floor baptistry there, and, and we've seen people say, I want to give my life to Jesus. And believe it or not, we've got a couple more in the pipeline. We've got a couple of teenagers in the pipeline for about two years now. I don't like water and I don't like getting up in front of people. And we are counseling. We had a campfire Wednesday night. We got onto that topic, counseled some more, counseled, it'll be okay. This is what we do to follow Jesus, you know. And uh, so anyways, um, and of course they uh, claim to have accepted Jesus Christ into their heart and Jesus has forgiven them of their sin but this baptism thing man what about all the other things we talk about I mean for Pete's sakes if if, if we just need Jesus's death to be, pay for our sin why do I have to show up every Sunday what is all of this other stuff that we've had is that just to pay for your salary pastor well we talked about that last week okay and uh, <laughs> that's supposed to be a joke and what is the deal here? So sometimes I think we get a little bit off. We tell people that God does all the work, and God does do all of the work. God does all of the work. And not only did Jesus save you, but Jesus is saving you. Because not only is there a point in your life that you can specifically point to, like I can when I was six years old, that I felt conviction at a revival service, that our, we were visiting another church, our pastor was preaching a revival service, and, and, and I knew that I was supposed to give my heart and life to Jesus that night. But that's not the end of the story. It's the end of the story of my sin record in heaven. It's the end of me going to hell. It's the end of so many things, but as far as my life on earth, that's just the beginning. I was six years old, man. I got a great-grandfather lived to be 95. What if I lived to be 95? My dad only made it 67 and a half, so that has me a little worried. But uh, what if I lived to be 95 from the time I'm six? I'm 40 now. What am I supposed to be doing with myself? And based on our story today, I want to ask you a question. Is it just preachers and missionaries who give their life to Jesus? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Not everyone is going to go into vocational ministry, but everyone, and I mean everyone, is a missionary. And that means when you go to your job and you earn your money, God has given you that money to serve Him with, whether it's to buy food, clothing, and shelter for you and your family because God wants you to take care of your family or if you're going to use it for something else, if you're going to give it to the church, if you're going to give it to other causes, or if you're going to do something with it. Um, I made a joke several weeks ago about buying that bass boat and telling people about Jesus while you're bass fishing. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. Whether it's your RV or your second home or whatever it is, buy it to the glory of God and use it in some way for the kingdom. We talk about giving 10%, but really, God is, if you belong to Jesus, God is supposed to own it all. And so we're going to talk about, especially since we are trying to revitalize our church here, and, and the sequel to The Narrow Road uh, that we called God's Smuggler here was Walking the Narrow Road, and it was actually about the Muslim world. And, and uh, <clears throat> Brother Andrew wrote, he had written off the Muslim world. He didn't think there was any Christians that lived in any of those Muslim countries. And here he had been the one to smuggle Bibles into the Soviet Union and meet with secret churches and underground churches and house churches. But he wrote off the Muslim world, oh, they're all Muslims, you know, what's the big deal? And he wrote in the late 90s that God had really convicted him about that and, uh, and that if the Western Christian world did not go to the Muslim world, God would bring the Muslim world to us. And it was just a few years later in 2001 that the Twin Towers fell and we all began to learn names of countries we had heard of, didn't really know where they were, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, we always just called them the Stan Brothers. And, uh, you know, learned, learned of what Sharia law meant, learned Arabic words like jihad and uh, other things like that. And... Uh, now, now we know. And now many of our missionaries serve somewhere that we can't tell you. 
And when we pray for them on their birthday, we only tell you their initials and very broadly that they are in the Middle East somewhere. What is the narrow road that God has called you to walk down? Number one on your sheet, Paul was traveling as a missionary, M-I-S-S-I-O-N-A-R-Y, as a missionary because Jesus had changed his life. Paul was traveling as a missionary because Jesus had changed his life. And you can find that story in Acts 9, as it says there on your sermon sheet. What you believe about the God of the universe affects your whole life. Now, Paul is a bit of an odd example. He's usually a really good example for us preachers and us guys that are in vocational ministry because he was already serving as a teacher, as, a, as someone who was on his way to becoming a member of the Sanhedrin, and, and he was a trained Pharisee, and he could brag about the teachers that he had sat under, and he was so zealous for the cause of Judaism, the kind of Judaism that was opposed to Jesus, recognizing that Jesus was the Messiah, that he asked permission of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem to have official papers that he could go to places like Damascus and arrest people preaching about this Jesus character and leading good Jewish people astray. And so he went to Damascus with authority from the Sanhedrin to arrest anybody preaching Jesus, and Jesus stopped him cold on the road to Damascus. Jesus changed Paul's life. And that is the question today. Has Jesus changed your life? And this is a very serious question. This is something that we must all grapple with. And, and, I, and I truly mean that. You know, over the years, we've, uh, throughout the 20th century, Baptists and other groups like us uh, became kind of famous for things like an altar call and a specific gospel presentation. And, and if you do anything for very long, you're going to have the discontents and the malcontents and the people who grumble, and, oh, you're not doing it quite right, or maybe we don't think that's exactly right. And I've, I've been part of that before because I've been to the meeting where the preacher gives a good gospel presentation and then it comes to invitation time and he says every head bowed and every eye closed so everybody obediently bows their head and closes their eyes and he says, now if you prayed that prayer for the first time today and you've accepted Jesus into your heart I want you to raise your hand nobody looking around nobody peeking well guess what when you're in the ministry you feel like you can peek Especially if you brought a group and you want to know if anybody is raising their hands. I did that when we took the youth to Judgment House. And uh, they're like, okay, you know, who, who wants to accept Jesus? We're going to send you with a counselor out in this other room and you can talk and you can ask all the questions that you want. And, uh, and of course, there's me just kind of, okay, one eye here. Any of my group? Do? And sure enough, two of our group left. And we, I asked them about it later. And uh, they say they accepted Jesus, and so we're working on them in addition to the other two we were talking about, baptism around the campfire. And so this is a fantastic thing, and I guess just to make a, a long story short, I've been, because I've peeked and I've seen no one raise their hand, and I've seen that preacher go, I see that hand. I see that hand, be praying for you, see that hand. Don't we have like 10 rules? carved in stone somewhere. One of them's like about lying or something. So it's a psychological trick. It's just in case someone is afraid to raise their hand because we know somebody's peeking. Well, other people are raising their hands, so it's okay. But I don't know, stuff like that. And that's probably the worst example, but, but these emotional ploys, there's a whole group of us younger, restless guys who are like, man, just getting people to sign on to something during an emotional moment and then you never see them at church again. We're all sick of this. We don't even want to make these emotional pulls. And, 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 and. But I tell you what, I've learned a lot in the last few years about making sure people understand the gospel and giving them an opportunity to respond. If you weren't here for Vacation Bible School when we had it this summer, uh, 
Now, group, pub I love group publishing. I think we're going with LifeWay for VBS next year. That's fine. I don't know. Okay. I was mistaken. But anyways, they all have a good way to share the gospel. And I'll tell you, this is going to be our new rule at church. Any way you share the gospel is better than not sharing the gospel, okay? I don't care how cheesy, corny, how much your pastor rolls his eyes whenever you tell him about your idea, okay? How you share the gospel is going to be better than not sharing the gospel. So if I roll my eyes, just ignore me. I don't even know what my eyes are doing sometimes. But anyways, I came out of that door dressed like Jesus, and Ashley did a fantastic job with her script. She took a lamp I made in shop class because it was the only lamp I, I uh, was going to let her tear up. And, uh, and we got a special bulb from the VBS company. And it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a fluorescent bulb. It looks like a regular old incandescent bulb, but it's a fluorescent bulb. And uh, she had to unplug the lamp, leaving it on. And she's talking about uh, the light, how the light is shining in your life. And uh, she actually took a little hatchet, the camping hatchet that we have, and cut the cord. And, oh, no, you feel like God can't reach you where you are in the darkness. And we had all the lights off. And I came out as Jesus. And if your fingers are moist, you can hold that bulb, and you can touch the two contacts on it, and it will come back on in your hand. There's residual electricity in there, and it uses your body as a conductor. And, um, and it's a good gospel presentation, but... As your pastor, I felt like it was missing something. So was I still wearing my Jesus outfit when I, okay. So I kind of broke character and was like, I want to say a few words because all of a sudden I was overcome with the idea that these kids are old, many of these kids are old enough to understand and I want them to know, I want them to know uh, that, that someone died on the cross for their sins and it's not just about coming to church and it's not just about getting dunked in water and it's not just about paying tithes and all of these things. This is very real. So I did my best to explain the gospel. A couple of kids got saved that night. They might have already been on that track. It's not about me bragging about my abilities as, as a pastor or anything like that. Uh, you know, and, and I find that it takes a village, like they used to say. Uh, you know, it, it takes coming to church a few times, your parents telling you, explaining the gospel to you, and then you go to church and find out that there's all these other crazy people that believe all this other crazy stuff too. And so maybe there is something to it. And then at some point you do make that decision and the, the call has to be real. What is God calling you to do with your Christian life? This is what God has called me to do with my Christian life. I'm not in some country where somebody's generally going to put a gun to my head and say, do you believe in Jesus? Boy, we could have that done within five minutes. I say, yes, they pull the trigger. Instead, the rest of my life is given to Jesus. And the same thing with Paul. And so because I've decided to chit chat instead of read the Bible, we're going to read a few verses. We're not going to read the whole thing. Uh, Number two on your sheet, Paul came to Philippi. Now, I know that many of you, you know some Bible stories, but all these journeys of Paul, uh, they, uh, they just kind of all uh, blend together. That's fine. Learn the Bible stories, but I challenge you. I challenge you once you're done learning these Bible stories about Paul, uh, go back and try to put it together in order in your mind. He took about three missionary journeys. It's very interesting, very interesting to watch Paul's life unfold and then watch your own life unfold. As you follow the Lamb wherever he goes, as you do whatever God gives you to do with your Christian life. Paul came to Philippi. Uh, this is what we would call northern Greece now. Found believers. They were believers in the one true God, and they were meeting. They didn't have a synagogue, but they would meet outside the city by the river for prayer. Uh, so they kind of made their synagogue out there as a prayer service on the Sabbath. And he told them about Jesus. And you can find all of this in Acts chapter 16, verses 11 through 15. Now, part of this sermon is that when you are following Jesus, and it's been very interesting to me. Um, my dad was a pastor, and I've been to many funerals and things, uh, and now I, I preach them as well, and we've had more than usual here lately. Um, and, and when tragedy strikes, I, remember, I don't remember 20 years ago, people being sick and tired of hearing that God has a plan. But every once in a while now, I guess we've gotten good enough at saying it that people now come at you with, don't tell me God has a plan in this. Don't tell me. And, and, and sometimes if you hit them with, you know, you just got to trust in the Lord. God has a plan. They'll go, oh yeah, what is it? And then you feel stupid because you don't know. 
man, some child has, has struck tragedy, car accident, uh, or it just out of the blue, especially something like childhood cancer. Thank God we're not, well, uh, we are dealing with that in the community, actually, come to think of it. But, but you know, when we've got to understand our own limits. The argument is God has a plan. God will make a way. And just because I'm human and I can't know exactly what it is, I can tell you lots of stories of tragic things happening and good coming out of them. But that doesn't mean that you can bring me your tragedy and I can say, well, now look here. God is going to do X, Y, and Z and see good will come out of it. I don't always know. I think there is some good that comes out of tragedy that we will not know until we stand before the Lord in heaven and he tells us there are things only God knows. Many people who are in grief and mourning, you just need to be there. You need to be like Job's three friends who didn't mess up until they finally opened their mouths after seven days of just sitting with Job. Uh, be like them before they open their mouth. Don't open your mouth. But we do as Christians believe that when bad things happen, God does have a plan. And the point of that is not to know what it is. The point is to trust in the Lord. We are going to see that with Paul. Number three, the ministry of Paul set a girl free from a demon. Powerful people saw Paul as a threat to their money. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, <clears throat> crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Verse 19, but when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowds joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Once again, number three, the ministry of Paul set a girl free from a demon. Who is in bondage to sin that you know? And the stories are countless these days. There's... Um, it, it always blew my mind uh, that because we have such strong-willed women in my family that any guy could get away with abusing a woman. And I, I, I mean, and my mother herself would ask, doesn't he sleep at some point? Can't you get, like, and she's not joking. Like, she just, seriously, um, don't you fix his food? I mean, come on, what's the deal here? Uh, but... As I got older and I met and dated a lot of girls at college and lived, I, I didn't get married till I was 32, didn't really meet Ashley till I was 30 or 31, and, uh, and learned that not everybody's mama raised them that way uh, to defend themselves. And, and not every dad was even present or put into his little girls that they were worth defending. And so... Uh, you have women who stay with abusive husbands, have themselves convinced they will never get love anywhere else and will stay. And sometimes we'll even quote some preacher saying, God hates divorce, and so I am stuck with him. And that is not necessarily the goal that this church has for you. We want to help you with your marriage, but we want you safe, and we want you, we just, you know, there's so many complicated things there sometimes, but it really isn't all that complicated. Uh, many people are in bondage, and Jesus sets free from bondage, and many times the bondage is not shackles on your wrists or ankles. It is in your heart and in your mind. And this girl was imprisoned by a demon. See, sin 
and everything. And she was a slave girl. And we are having issues with this. In fact, over here at the Fantasy Ranch, I understand that whenever they do get raided and they get shut down and they, get, they always come back, what they are doing there that is illegal is human trafficking. Okay? It's, we're not talking all consensual adults and women making money and supporting their We're not talking that kind of thing. We're talking about women trapped, women feeling, at the very least, feeling like they can't go have any other lifestyle, or literally trapped, and being told that bad things will happen if they ever go do something else, and not just taking off their clothes, but actual prostitution, which is also illegal in this state. And so, we have this around us. And we have people in bondage to sin. And Paul, through the power of Jesus, sets her free and people don't like it because it's going to mess with their money. And that is, nine times out of ten, people are happy to let you believe in whatever crazy thing you want to believe. And we're crazy. I mean, we believe Jesus came back from the dead. Literally, honest to goodness, Lee, defeated death. And I don't have to worry about death. And you don't have to worry about death. See, we're crazy. But, crazy people, like the new song from Casting Crowns, uh, we're crazy, but, but they're happy to let us believe that as long as it doesn't affect their money, or their political power, or whatever grants they're getting from the government, or the fact that maybe they're afraid somebody's going to sue them if they don't say everything exactly politically correct enough, and so, please Christians, just keep your mouth shut, be good citizens like the Bible tells you to, and folks... We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven first. First. And so Paul is unafraid. Paul lets this go on. He was probably as confused as we are by this. She's telling them the truth. Listen to these men. Uh, they are here to proclaim you the word of salvation. Paul's like, all right, spirit's speaking. But after several days of it, he gets annoyed. Like, I don't think this spirit's on our side. And he casts it out in the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus has power if you truly do represent Jesus and have him living inside of you. And they throw him into jail. And if you know the story, you know that Paul and Silas are, after having been beaten and thrown into jail, are singing praises to God Almighty in prison. And the prisoners got nothing better to do but then to listen to them. And then the ground shakes, and the doors fly open, and the chains fall off, and the stocks that they are in are opened. And apparently this happens in, in such short order that uh, the, the jailer runs in, scared that they're all going to escape, and he is going to have to serve every one of their sentences for them, because that was what it was to be a jailer back then in the ancient world. Uh, everything's fine as long as you keep everybody in the jail. So he's ready to kill himself when Paul calls out to him and stops him from harming himself and says, we're all here. We didn't go anywhere. Why they stayed, I don't know. But number four in your sheet, even in prison, Paul and Silas are singing praises to the Lord. Now, there's going to be times you don't feel like it, and there's going to be times that when I, as your pastor, tell you to praise the Lord anyways, Maybe it was the wrong time for me to say that. But in the end, you're going to have to come around to the fact that God has still given you the very breath that you breathe and that God is doing something and we trust in the Lord that whatever tragedy is happening in our lives, we are going to, uh, that God has not forgotten about us. And so we praise God. God is always worthy of praise regardless of what is going on in our lives. And so we follow the example of Paul and Silas. When you feel like you're in a prison and maybe it's just the darkness in your mind or maybe something outside of your mind is actually going down around you, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Remember this. There is a spiritual lesson here. Remember to praise the Lord. It may not magically solve everything around you, but if you tune your heart to the fact that God is still on his throne and you are still his servant called by him and working for him, it might, you, may, you might feel free regardless of uh, what your circumstances are. Number five, prisoners like Paul and Silas did not escape. Instead, God had a salvation planned. God wanted, they had already recruited some people 
to start a church there at Philippi, Lydia and her family, and Lydia had some money, and so she was going to support the new church plant, and Paul was busy training leaders when he got interrupted by being thrown into prison. God had one more person and his whole household that he wanted to be a part of that church in Philippi, and it was that jailer. And so as we talk about walking the narrow road, we're going to Sometimes what we see as a good thing, breaking people out of bondage, is going to be something that makes powerful people angry. And we're going to feel like we're in prison. Maybe we've been canceled. Maybe we've been uh, shunned by our friends. It's been amazing the last three or four years to see what all of a sudden relatives will not talk to you after you share an opinion on certain things. Be from, from Black Lives Matter to, to vaccines to masks to all kinds of things, all of a sudden people you've known for years have decided that you are evil beyond help. I thought that was our job, dang it. Quit shunning people like you're some kind of an uber-fundamentalist church over this politically correct stuff, man. We're finally learning to forgive, and y'all became, uh, uh, well, anyways, I think you get the idea. They stole it from church, shunning people and kicking them out and telling them that they're they're irredeemable. Of course, we don't tell you that here. We believe Jesus' grace can cover all, and we teach that, and we believe it, and sometimes it's difficult to live out, but we will do our best, and you never know. You never know if God has put you in prison for doing the right thing because he wants to cause a jailbreak, and he wants a jailer to get saved. And that is the message that I want to leave with you today, sure, Paul's a, Paul's a vocational minister, although I might point out he was a tent maker. That was his trade. He was bivocational. He still had to make his money in many cases on the side as he traveled from city to city. Maybe you're not called to travel from city to city, but whatever it is God wants you to do, and you need to be paying attention because God is giving you assignments all the time. He's given you talents and abilities, and he's given you uh, uh, relationships and spheres of influence. And at some point, if you're listening, God will point out how you can represent him, how you can share, uh, how you can invite people into his kingdom using what you have. And some of you say, I'm retired. I don't get out much. I just have the same friends I've had for 40 years. I don't know what your excuse is. But many times we are not hearing the call of God because we are not listening. And so we need to be listening for whatever it is, however God is going to use your life and the, the relationships that you have and the influence that you have on lots of people or very few people, God wants to use it, just like he did Paul. And remember, no good deed goes unpunished. This world is not under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so whenever you do something good, many times there will be pushback. But stick to it because you might see God do something amazing.